Sarah, thank you for that very nice introduction. And Nancy, good to see you again. Um, always excited to be working with the Plainfield Historical Society. So my presentation this morning is about New Jersey's first people, uh, the Lenape or Delaware Nation of Native Americans. And we're going to be covering about 12,000 years of history in a brief period. So thanks so much for joining us. And let me dive right in. When we think about New Jersey's Native American history, there are a number of different sources that we can use to understand this period. We can use artistic representations of Native Americans, both ancient and modern. And I'll talk a little bit about the image you're seeing on the screen uh, in just a minute. We can use archeology, span the material remains, the things that people left behind to better understand the past. Oral traditions, the stories passed down from generation to generation, are a particularly rich source of information for Native American history. We also have literally thousands of historic documents that speak to New Jersey's Native American past, especially important collections at the New Jersey State Archives in Trenton relating to the purchase of land from Native Americans. And then finally, we have something called experimental archeology, span where modern day individuals try to replicate the tools and technologies of ancient Native Americans. So let me talk just for a minute about the image that you're seeing. So this is an image of a creation story, uh, a Native American creation story, like those uh, once shared by the Lenape. And it shows, as you can see, a beautiful tree, Beneath it is a woman on the back of a turtle. Below that turtle in the water, you can see fish and a beaver and crayfish. And above her, you can see birds. And in one uh, version of a Native American creation story, all people on earth came from a woman who fell from a sky world, the world above, down through the air, ultimately landing on the back of a turtle. And that turtle form the basis for the land where we are today, a land that the Lenape would have called Lenape Hoke, the land of the Lenape. Um, and there she gave birth to children who went on to populate our world. So a wonderful creation story and a wonderful example of Native American art as well. Other examples of Native American art, and these are two artifacts from the collections of the Seton Hall University Museum. Uh, are intriguing but harder to interpret. Uh, these were collected by the late Herbert Kraft. Both of them come from the area of northwestern New Jersey around the Delaware Water Gap. The one on the left is what you might, well, they're both what you would call petroglyphs, carvings on stone. And there's a ruler in the one on the left. So you can see it's pretty big. The stone is about by four feet by four feet. It's irregular. It has designs on it in some ways, you know, akin to modern graffiti, but no doubt with more meaning. Um, and the question, of course, that puzzles us is, what do these images represent? Are they people? Are they spirits? Are they animals? We don't know because the context has largely been lost. Similarly, uh, in the bottom right, you can see another carving, and this is immediately recognizable. Uh, it's two hands put together, presumably, uh, with some, or perhaps I should say, with some spiritual significance, a wonderful, wonderful carving that has survived from the from ancient times until today. This is an example of experimental archaeology. So here you see me with some of my students, and we are trying to replicate the stone tools, the spear points, the arrowheads that ancient Native Americans made. And I think uh, we do this regularly at Monmouth with my classes. I think the biggest takeaway is that this is a very, very hard thing to do. So sometimes when we think of people living in what we might call a Stone Age society, that almost sounds derogatory. But when, when one tries to actually make stone tools, you find out very quickly how smart, how talented um, individuals were in the past, because this is very hard to do. In fact, I have a, a friend, Bill Schindler, 
who, uh, for his doctoral dissertation, attempted to live using only ancient of our Native American technologies on an island in the Delaware River for an extended period of time. So he was hunting, fishing, growing some plants. And he said that it was, frankly, the most challenging experience of his life and that he lost about 15 pounds too. Now, Native Americans uh, are a group of people we often think of as living in the past. And one of the takeaways I'd like you to have from this presentation is that Native Americans, the Lenape and others are still very much part of American society today and will be no doubt long into the future. And no matter where we are, we see reminders of our state's Native American heritage on the landscape. So I love this uh, map by Don Becker that was published in the encyclopedia, uh, published rather in an atlas of New Jersey by Maxine Lurie. Um, and on it, you can see some familiar place names, right? So uh, I know virtually we're in Plainfield. So we're close to Metuchen, Rawway, Wachung, all Native American names. Uh, we are not very far from the Raritan River. So these are all reminders of the folks who came before us in this area. So what's in a name? Uh, I've used a couple different terms already, uh, and I have Lenape or Delaware Indians up here. Uh, politically, of course, the Lenape or the Delaware are nations. And they exist in a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the United States. The word Lenape is an Algonquin word, and it means an Algonquin is a language group, just like you might say Romance languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian. Lenape means people. Uh, sometimes you'll see, especially in older documents, the phrase Leni Lenape, and that means real or true people. Uh, a term that I've used already this morning Lenape Hoking indicates the land of Lenape, and that's a that includes all of New Jersey, but it's a broader area, uh, extending up the Hudson Valley uh, to about Kingston, out onto Manhattan, Staten Island, Western Long Island, uh, into Eastern Pennsylvania and Northern Delaware. We did have uh, at least two major groups living in New Jersey: the Muncie. Uh, spelled various ways. This is one of the spellings north of the Raritan River and the Unami south of the Raritan River. And we can think of New Jersey even today as one small state divided, perhaps between uh, Giants and Jets fans in the north and Eagles fans in the south. Um, if we were to travel back in time, which as a historian is something I dream about doing all the time, uh, and we were able to interact with the Lenape perhaps before European contact, we would have seen groups of people organized into large extended family groups that anthropologists called bands. And they would have had names like Sanhican in the area around Trenton and Raritan in the area where we are today. Now, archeologists have spent uh, about 150 years since the 1870s, actively investigating New Jersey's ancient history. And I just want to share a couple examples of some of those archaeologists. This is, this is one of them. This is Charles Conrad Abbott, and he's kind of a, a heroic figure in the history of American archaeology. He grew up in Hamilton Township by Trenton. Um, he married well to Julia Olden, Julia Boggs Olden. Uh, her father owned a bank, and that meant that Charles never really had to work for the rest of his life, uh, at least not at a nine to five job. So instead, he devoted himself to researching nature uh, and New Jersey's Native American history. Now, when he was doing his work in the 1870s, most folks believe that Native Americans had only been present on this continent for a few thousand years. Abbott blew the doors off that idea. His discoveries in and around Trenton, and I have an image that shows some of them, simple stone tools uh, seen here to the right, reminded him 
of artifacts being found in Europe that dated back 60, 70, 100,000 years. And Abbott started asking why Native Americans couldn't have been present here much longer than most folks thought at the time. And um, while some of his specifics were wrong, the actual artifacts he was finding were not quite as old as he, as he hoped they might be. He argued vehemently, strenuously, that Native Americans had been present in the Americas for tens of thousands of years. And subsequent scholars have shown that he's correct. And of course, that also accords with Native American oral traditions, uh, many of which argue that Native Americans have been present in the Americas since time eternal. Now, Abbott, like any great heroic figure, had a nemesis. His uh, nemesis was this a sharp looking individual. This is Alice Herdlishka. Uh, he was a Czech scientist who worked at the Smithsonian Institution. And he was very, very critical of Charles Conrad Abbott. He argued that Abbott was a sloppy excavator, uh, that some of the things Abbott was claiming, for instance, that there was once an ancient race of people whom he called Homo Delawarens Delawarensis, man of the Delaware. Um, never existed. Uh, so they fought in scholarly journals for decades. And in some ways, Herdlishka and his colleagues were successful. But Abbott's contributions, essentially, that there was a very, very long history of Native American occupation of North America, was ultimately correct. In the early 20th century, the New Jersey uh, Geological Survey conducted a series of research projects documenting Native American sites across the state. One of the individuals uh, they, hub, they, uh, they hired was Max Schraubisch, seen here. Max was a German emigre who lived in Patterson. Uh, he supported himself when not working part-time as an archeologist um, by teaching piano. And apparently he never drove. Nevertheless, he carried out a massive archeological survey of the Northwestern corner of the state, largely using public transportation and bicycling to sites. Uh, he believed that some of the most important Native American sites would be found in caves. And I think he was thinking along those lines because in Europe, ancient, ancient sites of humans and human ancestors had been found in caves. Um, Trabish found a large number of sites. Uh, unfortunately, he got himself in a bit of trouble during the First World War um, when folks, I believe it was in Warren County, reported him to the local police um, as a potential German spy uh, who was up in the caves in the mountains digging around. They weren't quite sure what he was doing. Uh, it turned out that uh, you know, he was obviously able to clear himself. He was working for the state of New Jersey in the American Museum of Natural History. Um, his report and others, and there was one that actually took in the area around Plainfield, are very important for highlighting the archaeological sites relating to Native Americans that were known in the 19 teens, 110 years ago. Later in the 1930s, uh, New Jersey gets its first official state archaeologist, and she's rather a heroic character. Her name was Dorothy Cross or Dorothy Cross Jensen, um, and she had done a dissertation at the University of Pennsylvania on ancient sites in what today would be the country of Iraq. Um, during the Depression, she found herself between jobs and was hired to direct the state's Indian Site Survey. And this is really important on so many levels. First of all, she documents, and this is one of her progress charts, as you can see, she is documenting thousands of sites and also doing her own excavations. The other thing that's important about Dorothy Cross is she is a woman in what at the time was very much a man's world. And I would say that is changing in terms of archaeology generally. Most of my students today um, are female with, uh, I would say, uh, a solid 
minority of men. So uh, the equation has has flipped. But at the time when she was working, she was uh, almost unique in being a prominent female archaeologist working in the Northeast. She put hundreds of men back to work uh, on projects trying to resolve some of the thorny issues in New Jersey's archaeological history. Uh, here she is. Uh, this is a wonderful photograph. This is at the New Jersey State Museum. She uh, was always dressed to the nines. So you can see her in a dress here excavating at a site called the Abbott Farm after Charles Conrad Abbott. And she is meticulously uh, excavating a very, very large ceramic vessel that she actually appears to be kneeling within as she's working. Now, what have we learned from uh, all of that archaeology and the archaeology that followed uh, and that continues today? Well, um, prior to about 12,000 years ago, scientists know that northern New Jersey was covered by glaciers. So the area around Plainfield, really north of Metuchen, if you drive down, for those of you who are local, if you drive down Woodland Avenue, uh, very close to my house, uh, you would be driving down the terminal moraine, the final uh, resting place of thousands of stones that were once carried by the last glacier, uh, the Wisconsin glacier that covered North, northern North America. So before 12,000 years ago, landscape is glaciated, and then those glaciers start to recede, to melt through a natural process of global warming. The first archaeological sites, the oldest archaeological sites that we clearly have in New Jersey, date to 12, 13,000 years ago. However, archaeologists have started finding even earlier archaeological sites in the Pacific Northwest and in Latin America, indicating that individuals may have I think quite likely arrived in the Americas before 13,000 years ago. There is still a big question mark about when exactly that occurred. Uh, archaeology, archaeologists call these first uh, New Jerseyans Paleo-Indians. Uh, paleo simply means old, and they are represented archaeologically by distinctive spear points, uh, which have a flute on them. I'll show you an image in just a minute that were used in hunting. During this time period, the animals that lived in this area would have been very different from today. There would have been mammoths and mastodons. Uh, examples have been found as nearby as in the Great Swamp, uh, also in the Wachung uh, Reservation area. There have been finds made and other large animals that we call generally Pleistocene, and that's the last geological period before the Holocene, the one we live in today, Pleistocene megafauna, which means big animal. So if you want to impress your friends, start talking about Pleistocene megafauna. Archaeological sites include the Sam's Club site, a terrible, terrible name. Uh, Sam's Club had acquired a property in Ocean County, wanted to develop it when archaeologists found a Paleo-Indian site there. I had the opportunity to work on it. The Plenge site, which is up by the Delaware Water Gap, and a Turkey Swamp site, uh, which is preserved in a park in, in Monmouth County. This is a great map uh, produced by uh, Herb Kraft, really the Dean of New Jersey archeologists studying Native Americans. Uh, and he taught at Seton Hall. So, in the map, if you look closely at the dark black line shows where the glaciers ended. And you can see our, our neighborhood right here in Plainfield, the Plainfields generally, Scotch Plains, Westfield, South Plainfield. Um, the other thing you should know is that the area where you may go to the beach today, let's say you were to go to Long Branch where I teach in Seven Presidents Beach, uh, you would be nowhere near the shore. The shore is between 70 and 100 miles further east. So this would have been exposed land during uh, the last glaciation. And archeologists, especially Daria Merwin, uh, have carried out research offshore and actually found Native Americans. 
sites offshore, or at least the traces of them. These are some of those projectile points. These are not New Jersey examples, but they're very similar uh, that would have been used by Paleo Indians. And they tend to have a groove on the bottom, at on the side at the bottom, and that's what makes them fluted points, fluted so that they could be easily attached to a handle. So imagine a landscape if you were in a great swamp that looked like this rather than the way things look today, where we have squirrels and white tear, uh, white tipped deer. Remains of megafauna have been found at numerous sites uh, across the state. This is one of my favorites. This is the Mannington Mastodon. Uh, you can see her on display at the Rutgers Geology Museum. She was found in Mannington, which is in Salem County, New Jersey, um, in the middle of the 19th century, and actually was kind of a traveling carnival display uh, for a long time before George Cook, founder of uh, Cook College, acquires her for the Rutgers Geology Museum. We have archaeological evidence from a number of sites besides the ones uh, I mentioned of Paleo Indians. Here you can see Dorothy Cross and one of her crews, and they're at a they're at a site in northwestern New Jersey called the Fairy Hole, uh, and this is a cave site that has remains of Pleistocene megafauna and artifacts from that time period and later that she excavated, including what they called a giant ground slope. Uh, sometimes you see sloths uh, in um, in zoos today, but these would have been enormous examples right here. That's a view looking out from the ferry hole. I had an opportunity to be uh, camping in this area. It's pretty close to uh, Hope, New Jersey, and made a made a pilgrimage to the archaeological site. And the environment certainly shapes culture. So. As the Wisconsin ice sheet begins to retreat about 15,000 years ago, the environment heats up. We see spruce forest replacing tundra in southern and central New Jersey, and then pine and oak forest replaces spruce. Different trees need different environments. The Atlantic shoreline starts to move towards its current position. And by about 2,800 years before present, a modern climate had emerged, a climate that we're largely used to. There are some cold snaps since 2800 BP, and scientists debate. Obviously, there's global warming going on today, but they also debate whether we are perhaps uh, just in a brief period between periods of glaciation. So prepare those snowblowers. Following the Paleo-Indian period, we come into the uh, archaic period. Archaic also uh, indicates old. And the archaic period runs from about 11,000, 12,000 years ago until about 3,000 years ago. It's a forested period. And new technologies show up used by Native Americans. Things like this uh, beautiful stone axe carefully pecked uh, out of local stone. In this case, it looks like maybe a diorite or perhaps a sandstone. Uh, tools like this allowed Native Americans to interact in new ways with their environment, to cut down trees and make canoes, to build shelters using wood. Um, so it's sort of a technological revolution. Other woodworking tools show up, like this uh, beautiful slate gout. And containers, permanent containers show up. This is not to say that Paleo Indians didn't have containers, but we don't have physical evidence for them. So this is a bowl uh, from a site called the Haven site, uh, which is in Ocean County, and it's carved from a stone called soapstone. If you, if you have an older house, you may have a basement sink made from soapstone. It feels like talcum powder. It's a stone indeed, but it's very soft, so you can carve it with stone tools. Uh, other technologies also become uh, common during this time period, especially something called the atlatl, uh, which is essentially a spear thrower. It's a handle that is hooked onto the end of a dart or spear. It has a counterweight on it. This is a really beautiful example uh, carved from banded slate. I believe this is in the uh, Seton Hall University collection. And that handle hooked onto the edge of a dart would allow an individual 
uh, sort of average athletic ability to throw a dart or a spear a great distance with great force. In fact, Native Americans during this time period, the archaic period, did not yet have bows and arrows. They invent them later. So they're using this technology instead. You can pierce the hide of an elephant with a dart uh, thrown using an atlatl. Obviously, we wouldn't want to do that, but you could. Um, and even for someone who is, you know, at best of mediocre athletic ability, such as myself, um, it makes you feel like a major league pitcher throwing a dart with an atlatl. It gives you an enormous, enormous lever there. So very cool technology. Different types of projectile points start to be made. These are all made from a local stone called argillite uh, that uh, outcrops in places uh, near Flemington um, in the Delaware River and Hunterdon County. When first flaked, it's sharp and dark uh, black, gray, or purple, but left to weather, uh, it quickly loses its sharp edges and gets a little bit uh, more dull in color. One of the challenges about being an archeologist interested in New Jersey's past is that unlike say an archeologist in Turkey or uh, Greece or Rome, or even in Belize or Guatemala, we don't have a tremendous number of above ground reminders of New Jersey's ancient Native Americans. But uh, but this is uh, this is one. This is the Tuckerton Shell Mound. Uh, it's in Tuckerton, New Jersey, and it's an enormous mound of uh, primarily clam and oyster shells with some Native American artifacts mixed in. It has a, a good growth of cedar trees on it today. And, and also, I can assure you, a very, very rich growth of poison ivy, having visited the site. Uh, this accumulated from Native Americans uh, camping here and cooking over thousands of years. And uh, scientist friends of mine, such as Alan Mounier and Drew Stanzeski, who have researched this site, have plunged cores into the marsh around it. We're very close to the Atlantic Ocean. And what they found out is that this is quite literally the tip of what we might consider an archaeological iceberg. By about 3,000 years ago, the climate is stabilized and is similar to what we know today. And Native American lifestyles continue to evolve. So we don't want to think of them as static. These are folks whose cultures are evolving just like other societies. We enter a period that archaeologists call the woodland period, which, which I think reflects a uh, you know, a lack of uh, a lack of innovation in terms of how we name uh, ancient societies, because the archaic period was also living. The archaic people were living during a wooded period. Um, new types of dwellings become common. Things like longhouses, especially in the Upper Delaware. This is a replica at Waterloo Village, um, and also uh, wigwams smaller bark covered structures. New Jersey's Native Americans never never lived in teepees. That was uh, a product of the societies on the, on the Great Plains. So these are the buildings you would have seen here. Let's say if you were uh, an explorer or an earlier, early settler colonist in the 1600s. Uh, we have archeological traces of longhouses, again, up close to the Delaware Water Gap. And wigwams like this one have been documented in South Jersey. Um, there's a, a great farm market that's worth visiting in Little Silver, Monmouth County, called Sickles Farm Market. And they have uh, archaeologists have found traces of wigwams there. As you might imagine, they're pretty ephemeral structures. They don't leave a lot of traces behind. New technologies are developing. Pottery is uh, starting to be used in this area. It had been invented by Native Americans further south and is spreading north. It allows people to cook foods in new ways, get more nutrition from their food, and also to store, to store more food. So incredibly valuable. Smoking is becoming part of culture. Uh, these are tubular tobacco pipes. So think of them almost like cigar holders. And I have a centimeter ruler beneath them to show you that these are quite large. They were found in Bridgeport, Gloucester County, New Jersey, and they would have been packed 
with tobacco grown locally and smoked. This is probably not being done recreationally, but more as a spiritual experience. The tobacco uh, you might smoke today if you're a smoker is largely based on uh, strands from the Caribbean and and from um, South America, especially from Brazil. The no native tobacco grown in this area uh, during the woodland period was a much rougher uh, tobacco and was mildly uh, hallucinogenic. And these pipes are made from a particular type of what we call pipe stone or pipe clay from um, from Ohio in this case. And they're beautifully made. They really speak to the craftsmanship of ancient native people. Another thing to think about during the woodland period and before is that Native Americans have broad horizons. They're not just sort of hunkered down here, let's say in Plainfield at the base of the Wachung Mountains. They're they're trading widely uh, across much of the continent, and they're in touch with other groups of Native people. Um, these are also from Bridgeport in Gloucester County. They're enormous, beautifully made uh, bifacials, bifacially flaked stone tools. They're essentially large spear points or knives. They probably were not made to be used on a day-to-day -day basis. They're much too beautiful. Uh, they're very, very thin and somewhat fragile, and they're made out of stone imported to this area from Ohio. And it makes us wonder uh, what was going back to Ohio from New Jersey, maybe shell from New Jersey Shore, perhaps copper from northwestern New Jersey. But it seems like there were trade networks spanning big parts of the continent. Again, we get artistic uh, objects from this time period that are sometimes uh, very challenging to interpret, and this would be this would be a good example. Um, this is what we might call a um, a gorget or a decorative piece. It's pierced, so it could have been worn, strung and worn around someone's neck or in someone's hair. It has this crosshatch design that some of my colleagues, such as Greg Latanzi, our current state archaeologist, have argued may uh, represent uh, fish nets. Um, so very interesting, but we don't know exactly how it functioned. Here's another one of those gorgets or pendants. Uh, this one, uh, published on by my friend Charles Bellow, um, is thought to perhaps represent a turtle, and it's carved out of soapstone. People are also growing crops during this time period. Um, the big three for Native Americans, the three sisters are uh corn or maize, beans and squash taken together with um, venison and other <clears throat> animal protein would have made for a very healthy diet. This is a very large grind, uh, grinding bowl or what we might call a mortar that was found in Hunterdon County, Pittstown. There are a number of great examples uh, right by the Drake House Museum in Plainfield. So likely used for grinding uh, maize, but could also have been used to process uh, nuts, grind them, even acorns if properly processed. They don't go eating them without processing them. They're poisonous, uh, but they they can be uh, de-shelled, ground up, and then used as a, uh, used to make a form of flour. Uh, here you see some incredible projectile points, big bifacially flaked knives. These were found uh, by Dorothy Cross and colleagues excavating by the Abbott Farm. And this is what we call a cache, things that were purposely buried by ancient people so they could come back and get them again. There's a very large copper pin running through this cache of blades. Uh, that's unusual. Native Americans did have the ability to work copper. Um, but they uh, rarely, rarely did uh, because it was very hard for them to do so. Um, here in the uh, Delaware River, you see a uh, sturgeon, um, which is a fish that was local to the area that um, Native Americans would have once fished for or hunted, if you will, in the Delaware River. 
And uh, sturgeon are just kind of amazing animals that are now coming back in larger numbers into into our rivers. They have hard bony plates uh, on their backs, and they look like something truly primeval. Um, William Penn, who lived at a place called Pensbury Manor, north of Philadelphia on the Delaware, uh, talked about how sturgeon uh, would breach. They would jump out of the river. It was the most amazing thing he had ever heard. Uh, so imagine William Penn, founder of Pennsylvania, lying in bed at night, hearing these huge fish jump out of the river. This is a harpoon made out of bone that might have been used in hunting uh, for those sturgeon. Pottery becomes more and more elaborate during the woodland period. These are some beautiful examples from northwestern New Jersey um, that show beautiful chevron decorations, probably similar to uh, the sorts of basketry that Native Americans would have been making during this time period. And here's a wonderful collection of pottery from um, the New Jersey's Prehistorical Museum, uh, which is in uh, Greenwich Township uh, down in southwestern New Jersey. Tobacco pipes also become more elaborate. Uh, here are some with animals carved on the bowls. This one has what may be a dog or perhaps a fox or a wolf looking back at the smoker. And bows and arrows become part of the technological suite of Native Americans. So here you can see a number of actual arrow heads. Uh, we would call these, archeologists would call them Madison or Lavana points. And these are all from uh, Little Silver in Monmouth County. Other technologies, that we have from this time period really reflect the innovation of Native Americans. So this is a uh, this is a dugout canoe. New Jersey's natives did not use birch bark canoes. They were used up in uh, Michigan, and Maine, and other places further north. Our birch trees do not lend themselves to being made into canoes. Uh, but we did have dugout canoes, and this is fine examples on display uh, at the old Barracks Museum in in Trenton, and it was. Uh, dredged out of a lake in the early 20th century. Kind of amazing that it survives. So that takes us up to about the period of European contact. And we would have had, again, bands of Native Americans from the Minnesink up in the north uh, to other bands in the south, like the Great Sikonese in Delaware. And the area that's uh, lighter on this image is what, again, we would think of as Lenape Hoking. And then in the 1500s and 1600s, we get our first European visitors. Uh, in 1524, Giovanni Verrazzano sails up the coast. In 1609, Henry Hudson uh, sails up the coast. And he, in fact, he and his, uh, his mate, Robert Jewett, leave a detailed diary of their period off of the Jersey Shore. New Jersey during this time period is understood differently by these early uh, settler colonists than we might understand it today. Here is a map from the 1600s, and you can see the coast with the barrier islands is well defined, as is Raritan Bay and the Raritan River, but the interior of the state is not well understood. This is a, a diorama uh, actually created by the WPA during the 1930s, showing Europeans trading with Native Americans, uh, trading uh, clothes and metal tools, presumably for land. And if you'd allow me to digress for just, just for a minute, let me briefly tell you a story about this. So we have from Native Americans, a story of their first encounter with Europeans. Uh, it's been republished on, under the title Between Hope and Fear in a book uh, by Howard Green on New Jersey history, a reader. And basically it says that it tells the story of a Dutch voyage of exploration or the arrival of Dutch explorers from a Lenape perspective. So they say, the Lenape say, we were, we were on the beach and we saw a new island appear in the ocean. Um, an island had clouds above it. It had trees on it. 
there were people dra dressed in strange clothes on this island and their their language made no sense it was like dogs barking and then the island stopped and we all gathered around and a canoe left the island and came on shore and there were strangely dressed men here are strangely dressed men uh over to the right and they came ashore and they gave us a gourd to drink from. So that gourd is probably a bottle. And and we looked at it and we smelled it, but we didn't initially drink from it, not knowing what it was. But then one of our number took a large draft of the liquid and appeared to pass out. So you can imagine everyone was very upset. He then came back to life and we were able to communicate with each other. And it turned out that our guests were in fact Dutchmen and that the Dutchman wanted to come back, trade with us, and to have a little bit of land. And we were puzzled that they would want land because there was so much land. Um, why would they want it just for themselves? But they asked to mark out some land as their own for a garden, and we let them. And they came back year after year until eventually we had no land left at all. So this story is told by a group of Lenape, or Delaware Indians. And Delaware, I should have said earlier, comes from Lord Delaware, uh, but has been taken up and used by the Lenape since the 1600s. Lord Delaware was an English governor of Virginia who sent his ship north to try and get into the Delaware River and explore the river that today bears his name. So it's sort of a sad story from a Native American perspective of one of these first encounters. In the 1600s, many different nations, the Dutch, the Swedes, this is the capital of New Sweden, uh, down by Philadelphia International Airport, all claimed New Jersey, the land of Lenape, as their own. Sometimes there were horrible, what I would call genocidal acts committed uh, by Dutch governors, such as Willem Kieft, seen here in the painting, who dispatched troops into what today would be Jersey City or Pavonia to kill Lenape who had come peacefully to seek the protection of the Dutch from other Native American adversaries. There were also settler colonists such as William Penn seen here as a young man who engaged in much more peaceful interactions with Native Americans. In fact, Penn might be considered an early anthropologist as he participated in dances and ceremonies with the Lenape. And this uh, wampum belt uh, from the 1680s at the Philadelphia Museum of Art is related and relates to that time period. And it's believed to show Penn and a native leader holding hands as brothers. This was a time period though also of great confusion. And I'm gonna digress with one other uh, story. It's a story of uh, Richard Hartshorn, an early settler in what today would be Middletown, New Jersey. Mr. Hartshorn moved south from Rhode Island. Uh, he was of English descent. He was a Quaker. He purchased land quite a lot of land, thousands of acres of land that today would include Sandy Hook, parts of Middletown, parts of Highlands and Atlantic Highlands. And he built a house for himself. This is a map that was rediscovered a few years back uh, in a private collection. It's now part of the Monmouth County Historical Association's collections. It shows the Navasink River. It shows a number of small houses William Hartshorn's house, one of his sons, Colson's 105 acres, Colson's house. Uh, Clay Pit Creek is over here, Davis's house. And the beacon, beacon was a uh, beacon erected about where Twin Lights is today. So you can see there are essentially four or five different tracts of property. Today, there are probably 20,000 people living in this area. Hartshorn moves south and he attempts to put up a house and a group of Native Americans come to him and say, you're building a house for us. And he says, no, 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 I am not at all. I bought this land from a realtor, Christopher Almy in Rhode Island. I'm building a house for my family. We're going to live here. And the Lenape say, 
well, that makes no sense. We don't know what Rhode Island is. We have no idea who Mr. Almy is. And you're building a house on our land. So you must be building a house for us. Hartshorn is interesting. And we know this story because he writes about it. Uh, he then does something extraordinary. And he says, OK, well, what do I have to do to make this right? And Elenape said, well, you have to buy the land from us, which he does. Now, some years later, and this is a document from 1698 from that same collection of early colonial documents, the Lenape come back and they say to Hartshorn, when you bought this land from us, we didn't understand all the stipulations. We didn't understand that you didn't want us here anymore, that only you could live here, that we couldn't go hunting that we couldn't take old trees for canoes, that we couldn't go fishing on this land anymore. So if you don't want us here at all, you're going to have to pay us yet again. So this is a document between Richard Hartshorn and a group of Native American leaders. You can see they've made their marks. They don't necessarily know how to read and write in English, but they have signed this document in their names, Bowapon, next to his mark, the Tokus, next to his mark, are both here. Um, and Hartshorn says, fine, I will pay you yet again uh, for these lands. You're right, we did understand that differently. Even more fun in this same collection of documents is this small receipt. And it says, Captain Stout paid the Indians a barrel of cider for me, and I gave them a note, so that's a bill, money, for an anchor of rum, because they should not drink it at my house. Richard Hartshorn. So alcohol is part of this transaction. And Hartshorn, perhaps uh, an advocate of temperance, is a Quaker, does not want the alcohol consumed at his house. And then it goes on. When the Indians sold the land, though except hunting, trees for canoes, fishing, fowling, plumbing, this is probably huckleberrying and such. Huckleberries, they would have been using that term for raspberries uh, that I bought of them. And they have not proven since to be troublesome. Richard Hartshorn. So Hartshorn has this unique relationship, I would say, with the Native Americans, a negotiated relationship as these two groups of people are trying to better understand each other. What about traces of Native Americans from colonial New Jersey? Sometimes we see things like this uh, gravestone, um, which is believed to be associated with Native Americans up in uh, Hackensack, New Jersey, the church on the green from 1713. Note the canoe-like image, the arrows, and the pipe-like image at the top. There are grave markers for individuals like Akinikin, a Native American leader who died in the 1680s in Burlington City and was buried in a Friends or Quaker meeting meeting house, burial ground. There are artifacts that archeologists like Herb Kraft have excavated, such as this incredible kettle uh, used by Native Americans to cook food, but produced in Holland and traded to Native Americans. And then we have modern Native artists uh, like Sotsbach, who produced this incredible image of uh, Teddy Uscom, a Native American leader born in Toms River, New Jersey, who lived much of his life in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, dressed, as you can see, in a mixture of Native American garb and European finery. The 1700s see New Jersey's natives displaced from much of their land. Many of them moved west, though some remain in place. Uh, the walking purchase of 1737 steals a large part of East Central Pennsylvania from the Lenape that had been a traditional homeland. These two portraits are the only surviving portraits we have of Lenape from this period. The man on the left is Lapawinso, the man on the right is Tishkahan. Uh, they're both displayed at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And interestingly enough, they wear traditional pouches, they have traditional tattoos, but they also have European goods, a tobacco pipe, these blue robes that they're wearing, showing that they are people living effectively in two cultures. Missionaries try very hard uh, to convert the Lenape. Uh, this is a painting 
uh, showing missionary to the Lenape in the Ohio country. Some will become Christians. Uh, others retain their traditional beliefs and uh, resist the missionaries. One group of natives who do take up Christianity and become Presbyterians moved to a community called Bethel in Monroe Township in 1746, living with David Brainerd, a Presbyterian missionary. And traces of their community have been found by archaeologists. This is a plan view that shows a cellar of a house. And here is a tobacco pipe uh, excavated from that cellar hole. In the 1750s, New Jersey's Native Americans, those who remain in New Jersey and have not moved further west, uh, sign a pair of treaties with the state. One is in Easton, Pennsylvania. Uh, another one happens right here, uh, but let me talk in, in southern New Jersey. The one in Easton uh, essentially concludes peace between the governors of Pennsylvania and New Jersey and the eight confederated Indian nations. Note here they're called the Delawares, the Unami, the Minisinks, the Wappings, I think Wappingers Falls, the Mohicans, and they're also working with several nations of Indians living on the Ohio. So the Indians are moving further west. This is the Crosswick's Friends Meeting House in Burlington County. This is where the other treaty is signed. Um, these treaties result in the creation of a reservation, the only one we ever had in the state in Brotherton, uh, Burlington County. This is today's community of Indian Mills near Medford. Um, it is a planned community established for Native American residents. Cottages are built for the Native Americans. A sawmill, a church, a school, and a gristmill are all constructed. Um, and archaeologists have found some traces of this community. This map at Rutgers is pretty fantastic in that it actually gives us the names of individuals associated with some of these dwellings. But for the majority of natives, especially by the period after the 1760s, many of the Lenape are engaged in what I would call a great diaspora, moving north and west to try and put some distance between themselves and the settlers, moving west to Ohio and in Indiana and in Wisconsin. So today, we have substantial populations of Lenape descendants in New Jersey, but also in Wisconsin and Oklahoma. A handful of natives stayed behind, such as Indian Anne, and this is uh, her house in uh, Indian Mills. When her kin moved west, she chose not to. But those who moved west retained their traditional language, their traditional culture. And this is a wonderful painting by a native artist, Edward Spybuck, that shows the Lenape ceremony. And I love the fact that the people painted here from the early 20th century are, are waving to us as if they are saying hi to us from their new home in the West. Some of the groups that remain locally uh, have both strong roots and strong ongoing traditions. The Sand Hill Indians lived in the area in and around Neptune Township, close to where I teach. Um, James Lone Bear Reavy, seen over here to the left in the headdress, uh, headed up New Jersey's American Indian office for much of the late 20th century and is buried uh, right here in South Plainfield, New Jersey, a wonderful fellow that I had the opportunity to meet. So today we have federally recognized groups or nations, the Delaware Tribe of Indians in Oklahoma, the Delaware Nation in Oklahoma, in the Stockbridge Muncie in Wisconsin, all descendants of Lenape. We also have state recognized tribes still present in New Jersey, the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape, the Ramapo, and the Powhatan Renape. And there are other groups, again, such as, pardon me, the Sandhill Band that I mentioned before. So one of the things to end that I would ask that you take away from this presentation is not only do we have an amazing 12,000 year plus Native American history in the state. And that goes back well before the pyramids were constructed in Egypt or the Colosseum in Rome 
or the Great Wall in China, but that this is a cultural tradition that continues today. And this is a photograph at a Native American powwow right here in New Jersey. I, if I recall correctly, this is the powwow uh, that occurred at the opening of a new national park in Patterson. So it's a legacy that continues and a proud part of our state's heritage. For more information, certainly feel free to reach out to me directly through email. Uh, another important group that has been studying New Jersey's Native American past since the 1930s is the Archaeological Society of New Jersey. And all of those tribal nations have their own web presences as well. So thank you so much for spending some, some time uh, with me this morning. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll, uh, we'll open up for any questions.